Plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug. In fact, plug all of the mugs. You can find this mug and lots more on the Pop Astro shop. And if you are a regular viewer of Pop Astro Live, you will know that I've usually got horrible water in my mug from the laundrette where I am broadcasting. That makes it sound like I get water out of the washing machine. It might as well for the way it tastes. But this evening, because I have travelled with Kettle, I've actually managed to make myself a brew. And in this mug, I have got smoky Lapsang Souchon tea, and it's absolutely delicious. So here comes the countdown. Yay, it's Friday, it's Pop Astro Live, and I'm pretending to be jaunty, even though I've just eaten a whole Indian takeaway, and it's not only weighing heavy on my mind, it's weighing heavy on my stomach. So if you see my eyes glaze over at various points tonight, know it was the onion barges, lim, lam, lim vindaloo, lamb vindaloo, and um, what else did I have? Oh, uh, half a Peshwari naan, that's the big heavy one full of desiccated coconut, but it was nice. It was nice. So have we got a show for you this evening? Well, it looks like we've already got comments flooding in. Oh, Paulina, you know how to flatter me. Thank you. Three kisses back in your little lovely face. Um, okay, this is Pop Astro Live. If it is your first attempt at watching this show, hold on to your hats and headband. Good evening. Pop Astro Friday Live, what a lineup for tonight. We have got an awesome lineup. And I must say, thank you so much to Mr. Southers, Southers for helping me arrange some tip tippity tip tap top tap dancing guests. Um, this is your show this evening. Good evening. Now these comments are getting distracting. You know, like when you're working, uh, when you're trying to work and your Facebook messages are popping up, it's a little bit like that. But these are great. These are the best kinds of inter interruptions we can have. Uh, hello from a cloudy and damp North Yorkshire. Will these clouds ever part? The sob song of the astronomer. Ian, hi, Vicky. I hope you don't need to make a quick set. Do you know what? It's my first ever Vindaloo. Vindaloo is so underrated. They've made it sound like it was an utterly terrifying fire dish, and instead it was rich and spicy. My first ever Vindaloo, absolutely delicious. I'm a convert. I'm a convert. Hi, David. Good to see you here. And Catherine, where's Cosmo? He, it. Don't know whether it's got a gender, but it's here. <laughs> we'll call him a he for now. Cosmo is here with co-host. Come here, Gemini Jones. Oh, this winds up Paul Sutherland, this does. This really winds up Paul Sutherland. He posted me this awesome little um, knitted astronaut, and he calls it Buzz Waldron, but I call it Gemini Jones. So his, his, his um, real name is Buzz Waldron, stage name Gemini Jones, but Gemini and Cosmo both live on my telescope. Speaking of which, guess what I did last Saturday night? I had my telescope out all night. The skies on Anglesey, fourth windiest place in the UK, cleared up, the wind dropped to zilch, and we had the most exquisite moonless night. And I got my Celestron Star Sense Explorer out, which is a beautiful gadget. It is the world's first telescope that you just slot a mobile phone into the dock, and you use the GPS in the phone to whiz you around the sky. So it's a manual telescope. There's no motors or anything, but you can get around that sky faster than any go-to telescope. I reckon between five and 10 seconds to any target. So start dropping in the comments all the great things that you've seen in the sky. If you've got a bit of clear time this week, I know we're supposed to have had Aurora, but maybe you got some imaging done on Saturday night or Sunday night even. What did you image? Tell us what you've been up to. I saw Mars. I saw, I can't remember the name of the nebula now. Oh, it wasn't the Helix. I saw a dusty little ring nebula, which I've never seen before. I saw so many different things with that telescope, all on my own and all with no prior knowledge of the sky or at least in-depth knowledge that you would need if you were just doing that unaided. So um, 
it really helps the society if you share the video. So please contribute in the chat room and please just hit share. It only takes a second girl to share this feed. Um, with every share, yet another asteroid sample will be returned to Earth safely. But more about that later. Let's have a look. A clear night. I must have dreamt it. It felt like a dream. It was so beautiful and otherworldly. Good evening, Vicky. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Kath. We're going to be plugging the merchandise in the shop. Not you. You're not part of it. Uh, the necklaces. The necklace. The sundown necklaces. We're going to be talking about this later on, which is available in the shop. I've had this explained to me by my learned astronomy teacher. And this is the new exciting goes backwards that way this we're going to come to <laughs> it's hard to do it this thing here we're going to be talking about this later that bit in the middle is very new and exciting apparently according to my astronomy lecturer hello in london it's very cloudy hello madeline and meow she's got the nest kisses i was out last saturday night as well mars still looking nice and a few double stars good work david that's what we like totally cloudy all week so not even a glimpse of the sun. I know. Are you all taking your Vit D supplements? Blimey, need it this time of year. So, um, on tonight's show then, excuse me, I never have a real cup of tea with this show. I don't ever drink caffeine past 2 p.m. This has got caffeine in it. So if I turn into a Jill in the box, you will know why. On tonight's show, we have got Paul Money, who is uh, talking about observing moons in the solar system, what to expect from the Geminids and how to observe them. And also a little bit about imaging asteroids, which actually turns out is really unimpressive. Uh, we have also got Professor, excuse me, just resizing my window, Alan Fitzsimmons, world comet expert. He discovered a new comet just this week. He's going to explain what we can learn from our studies of smaller bodies in the solar system, such as the asteroids, comets and meteor showers. And then I'm so sorry to do this to Professor Elizabeth Tasker. We are waking her up in the land of the non-rising sun because it's still 5.30 in Japan at the minute um, to tell us uh, what it would be like, what it was like to be involved with the big news story of the past week and also what it's like to be a British scientist working in Japan. Two words, Hibusatu. So without further ado... Let's go over to a very festive looking Paul Money. We can see him lurking in the green yard. Three, two, one. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Hello there. Oh, we make a great tag team of bright colour, don't we, Paul? <laughs> uh, there we look at me trees. Look at me trees. Don't look around that. Look at me trees. <laughs> have they got a star of Bethlehem on them? No, because it'd have to be a twin conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, wouldn't it? Oh, God, I nearly spat my tea out then. Sorry. <laughs> you would have owed me for a new webcam then, Paul. <laughs> very, very good. So where are you this evening? At home. Um, uh, Astro Space Base, as we call it. The space. Oh, right. <laughs> and what, where is that then? Should um, I want to talk to you? It's my little office. So uh, everything happens here. Well, no, no, I don't want your grid reference. I want to know, like, what, what area of the country you're in. <laughs> <laughs> well, grid references. <laughs> Go on. I'm in Orncastle, Lincolnshire. And uh, like everybody else, clouded out at the moment and desperately waiting for that clear spot so I can see Jupiter and Saturn in the evening sky. I did hear somebody actually put, well, I didn't hear, somebody wrote on fo Facebook the other day. They just put, what a ridiculous hobby. And I thought, you know what it is, isn't it? <laughs> Ridiculous hobby, you're the <laughs> ridiculous hobby, good grief. Uh, it's a frustrating one, isn't it? I mean, you know, we we battle against the weather all the time in our country. Uh, well, well, I suppose other people around the world, they, they struggle as well. But, uh, you know, hello from Arizona. Yes, exactly. Sort of thing, you know, I bet you oh, get... Yeah, show off, show yeah. off. Yeah, clear skies there. But, uh, yes, it's one of those things, isn't it, sort of thing. That's why you've got to grab the opportunities, like you did last Saturday. Oh. Uh, quick look out as well, sort of thing. So uh, I was out as well, but we got a lot of fog rolling, so, uh, which is a bit frustrating. Uh, but uh, it's, it's what we have to live with, isn't it, sort of thing. So you, we make every astronomical moment count. Sort of Great. Well, you truly do, Paul. So um, I'm going to hand over to you now. First of all, what would you like to chat about, Paul? 
Well, one of the things that uh, I mentioned to you a while back was the fact that it's surprising how many moons of the solar system we can actually view. We know that the, the planets have got lots and lots of moons now. I mean, Jupiter, I mean, it must be over 70 now. And Saturn's getting close to that as well. It gets ridiculous. But the vast majority are not visible to amateur instruments. But there are actually quite a few that you can see. Um, and there's, there's one obvious that you, know, it, you either love it or hate it. <laughs> that big bright thing that's up in the sky at times, our own moon. So any astronomical instruments for that, do you? You can watch the phase of the moon sort of thing, you know. Yes, Kath, I, I, I thought I'd put something festive on, didn't I? I surprised Vicky when we did a test run earlier. Sort of yeah, thing. making so, me feel slightly underdressed for the occasion. I've gone for Ski Bunny Chic tonight. Well, she thought she got the wrong video feed. <laughs> <laughs> So but, what moons can we view then, Paul? No, I mean, the moon is obvious. And obviously using binoculars, you know, it's amazing what detail you can see on the moon. But uh, it doesn't take much, really, to, to look at the moons of Jupiter. We've got the Galilean four moons of Jupiter. Uh, so uh, even uh, some people have seen them with the naked eye. And I think the ones when they're the furthest part, which is Callisto and Ganymede from uh, Jupiter's disk, because otherwise it'd be a bit bright. But binoculars will easily show all four moons if they're in the right position. And uh, I saw them the other night, so I had a little brief gap uh, catching an image of Jupiter and Saturn. And uh, you could see the three of the moons, and ironically, one of them, Callisto, was actually in front of the disk, so you couldn't see it because of that. Um, but uh, So modest equipment can show you the Galilean moons for a start. And uh, then you move on to Saturn. That's the next one. Uh, with a, a, a relatively easy uh, moon, and that is Titan, you know. So Titan, again, can be seen in binoculars and small telescopes. Um, large binoculars, really, to get a, a good view. But, uh, you know, so that so already we've got sort of six moons straight off the bat. Um, but it doesn't stop there, because those are, as you've got large telescopes, you can start pushing a bit further out. Now, before we move out, you've got Saturn, I say, with Titan. But actually, you've got several other. You've got about six moons you should be able to spot with an eight-inch telescope at least. So uh, you've got Rhea, Tethys, Dione, uh, and uh, Enceladus and Mimas, uh, and Iapetus as well. So I always prefer to pronounce it Iapetus. I never know whether it's the right way of pronouncing it. Is there a right way or is there a wrong way? I don't know. So uh, there's quite a few moons around Saturn. There's more moons around Saturn you can see with modest equipment than there is actually at uh, Jupiter. But Jupiter shouldn't be given up with completely because if you're really tenacious and you can block the brightness of Jupiter, you can get a Malthea uh, as well. So you get a fifth moon at Jupiter. And if Whoa. you've got a fairly large telescope, you can actually see Himalaya as well. And I've done that with a 14-inch Dobsonian. I actually viewed uh, Himalaya as well. And the way you do that, just like, as we were mentioning about asteroids, the dots, you know, there, and so essentially you had to follow it over a series of nights to watch it slowly move across the sky in coordination with Jupiter moving against the background stars as well. So uh, so potentially you've got around about six moons at Jupiter that you could see with your instruments. And then we move out to Uranus, you know, it's surprising, you know, I, I that was one of the reasons why my first ever contact with Patrick Moore when I, I wrote to him and he sent the usual postcard, type, type, right, sort of thing, because uh, I asked him how many moons of Uranus he could see, because I'd got a 14 inch telescope by then. And he wrote back and said, with his 15-inch, hello indeed, welcome to the sky at night. Um, with a 15-inch, he'd seen all five of the classic moons. Uh, and Miranda is the hardest, close to the disc, very, a lot of glare. And I succeeded this year in actually about seeing Miranda. Up until then, I'd seen three, and then I made it to four with Umbriel. And then we actually got Miranda this year. So uh, quite really pleased in actual fact uh, with that sort of thing. So uh, I was, you know, I was quite cock a hoop. But then there is... Triton, uh, Triton, sorry, at Neptune. So, you know, there's quite a few moons out there that you can potentially uh, grab, depending on the telescope you've actually got. So I find it fascinating to track them down and also try to image them as well. So that's the key as well. If you, It's nice if you can get a, a picture just to prove you've actually got it as well. But you have got to be careful. I had a, a friend actually, he, he may have been on here, I can't remember who it was, but they posted a picture, showed the moons of Uranus. Uh, labeled all the moons of Uranus, what they hadn't done, they hadn't actually installed all the star catalogues and one of them was a star. Oh, <laughs> so no. It's always embarrassing. I think, do, do I tell them? Do I tell them? Do you do, 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 do them what? You know, so I, I send a little message saying, um, that one's a star. And I then annotated because I'm I'm a nutter when it comes to getting all the star catalogues in on my software because I, I do not want to be fooled. Yeah, I don't want to be fooled there, Jackie. I don't want to be fooled. Don't be fooled. <laughs> 
<laughs> don't be fooled. So, don't be fooled. You know, if you if you can push your boundary out of the moons of the solar system from uh, you to quite a, quite a few in actual fact, if you're really tenacious. Whoa, well, I'm just changing the subject ever so slightly. I forgot to say, as I was motoring around the sky with my Celestron star sense the other night, uh, I did. Uh, I mean, like, I'm a very, the most amateur of amateur astronomers. And for the first time ever, and it's only because the skies have never been right and my astronomer friends haven't known where it is, but I saw both Neptune and Uranus, little pale matte milky dots. There, I was all on my own. It felt like I'd made a discovery. It was such a personal moment to be gazing at them all on my own. It is. And, you know, um, I, I'm friends with uh, Dr. Alan Chapman, and I run the Horncastle Astronomy Weekend, which is sadly we couldn't do this year. But we, we invited him up, and it was a clear night over the weekend on the Saturday night. And he'd never seen Uranus and Neptune. And we were able to show him Uranus and Neptune. And he was cock a hoop. He couldn't believe it. But it wow. Actually, he did it at the Horncastle weekend. So I was quite proud of that. So, so it's not, not just, I, I'm not lagging behind the times then when, when I see stuff like that. Oh, no, I know. It's surprising how many people haven't. I mean, Uranus technically is naked eye, and I have seen it a couple of times with the naked eye, but you've got to have good dark skies. Now, you've got good dark skies in Anglesey. Oh, yeah. Well placed now for you to have a go. So get Ooh. a oh, sort of thing, perhaps something like that. <laughs> I was just about to say, how can we get a crowbar? To, well, no, Paul, I'm going to be honest. I, run, I won your book in a raffle, and oh. I think every astronomer should have a copy of your diligently curated night scenes book. It's it's a real it's a, it's a bit of a, a kick in the teeth at the moment because unfortunately I can't do the printed edition for the twenty twenty one, but mm. I have the PDF and a Kindle. Um, and in fact, the PDF and Kindle been for the first half of the year, and I've actually increased the page number. <laughs> when you when you've got PDF and Kindle, it doesn't matter how many uh, pages you've got because you don't have to worry about the pagination and the printing costs. So, uh, so instead of thirty-seven pages for the half year, it's ended up being fifty. So that can you can get that. It's just it's not the same as not holding a real book is the sort of thing in your hand. You know, so there we are. So uh, it's going to be a shame not having a printed edition. But you know, it's one of those things we have to roll with times, and that's the circumstances at the moment, isn't it? Oh, Paul, well, well, just give us a little de delve into night scenes. Your um, book for pretty much knowing where everything is in the sky at any time. Well, the PDF follows the same format, but the only thing is you don't have the fold-out pages. Oh, I so love them. The fold-out pages sort of make it rather unique. So there we are, sort of thing. Yeah. You don't need to see me. I'm boring. So there we are. But uh, you've got your monthly star chart there, sort of thing. And it, it says there for uh, July, you can see positions of when the moon's next to the planets, etc. Meteor showers, the moon phases when the moon... I'm trying to get this so you can read it, sort of thing. But, uh, you know, there we are. But you get the idea, you've got charts that I always make up myself. I mean, we had Venus in daylight sort of thing, an occultation, which, of course, was cloudy. <laughs> I write this, and as I do each event, I have mentally, a, it'll be cloudy. It'll be cloudy. It'll be cloudy. Um, you know, you just have to hope that you'll, one day you'll get a clear spot sort of thing. But uh, but that's the idea. So it's, it's what you can see with naked eye and binoculars as such. And I say, um, the PDF it is quite detailed this year, even though it's only half the year. And then in a little bit later, about a couple of months time, I'll be producing the uh, part two for the rest of the year as well. So uh, so there, there will be a night scene. It's just a real shame it's not printed, you know. But, well, one of those things. So um, we have got some interesting comet and asteroid specialists coming up next. And I said, Paul, can you maybe do something about uh, imaging asteroids? And you just said, the dots. <laughs> well, they are. I mean, the, the, the trouble with asteroid means starlight as I'm sure Alan will actually t talk about as well. Um, so, uh, I mean, it was William Herschel who coined the term asteroid, which literally does mean starlight. So uh, when you photograph them, you really need to take a sequence of photographs over a period of time so you can see the dot slowly moving against the background stars. So then you know you've got the asteroid. So, uh, you know, uh, Jeff has said, well, it's from my website, astrospace.co.uk. Oh, I didn't realise I could get so many plugs in there, Vicky. But uh, yeah, so, you know, it, 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 but it is exciting when you've captured an image of an asteroid and you've got that dot because you can say at least you've seen an image, an asteroid. Uh, but just don't tell you, don't show your friends because because you, you always show your friends this picture of a star field and then say, guess the dot. Guess the dot. <laughs> you, know, you could do that for a competition, you know. 
chart thinking, yeah, you could do that. Do that as a competition sort of thing. Do a star chart with a dot in it and say, which is the odd one out? Which is the asteroid? Oh, that would be cruel, wouldn't it? Oh, gosh, it really, really, really would be. Oh, what like um, like the old-fashioned spot the ball? Yes, yes. Spot the star. Spot the asteroid amongst the stars because they look star-like. They're just dots. But uh, I say they are fascinating to watch. And those who watch asteroids um, with telescopes, you can actually, although you don't see any detail, you can watch the light variations and it can give you two things. It can tell you the rotation rate, but you can also watch for an, an object such as an asteroid passing in front of a star. You get an occultation and that gives us the size of the asteroid. It's only one core, but if you've got lots of people across a region sort of thing. And I, I mean, it's many years since I last did mine, but I did uh, one in 2000 and 2001 and I watched an asteroid. And whereas everybody else got the main asteroid occultation, I was just outside the thing, but I got a blip. So I contacted Richard Miles at the BAA and told him, and he, and he, I, whether he was joking, I said, you never know, Paul, you might have discovered a satellite of Vibilia. So I, mean, I will never know, you know. I mean, you know, can they call it Money's Asteroid? Uh -huh. Have you got one named after you yet, Paul? I think you deserve one. Oh, no, I'm not important enough for that sort of thing, sort of thing, you know, but uh, it doesn't matter. I'm waiting to discover that comic because at least you can name the comic. Can you imagine Comic Money. Oh, that would be but so good. With that, though, is that it'll be the one that's going to destroy us, and then I'll get black. <laughs> Comet money, yeah, money, the dem cause the demise of everything, the root of all evil and earthly destruction. Am I? Aww. Oh, um, um, Gwyneth Huter, Huter here says, great to see you again, Paul. Who remembers the AAC? The Amateur Astronomy Centre, yes, up at Todmorden. Yes, oh yes, I was a member until about 2000 myself, where they were trying to build an, a, a, an astronomy centre for the whole country. Um, right. I think a 40-inch telescope. I don't wow. think it ever got off the ground, but the 30-inch did eventually get built and is in an observatory there as well. So uh, quite an amazing project, really, sort of thing. But uh, yeah, it's uh, that, them were the days. We, we had star parties in a huge great marquee <laughs> and I had to do talks with a generator going in the back using an old-fashioned slide projector. Remember them slide projectors? Oh, Vicky, you're too young. I am. <laughs> I sure am. Um, oh. Steve Fractal's the man with a billion faces and counting, says here he's got everything crossed for the 21st, and I was thinking, what is it, the solstice? But no, well, it is, but what else? It's the conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn. Yes, careful doing that. That could be rude. <laughs> but... <laughs> It is the first time since 1623 they'll have been that close. So that's how unusual it is. And you know, I just hope we get, even if I get half an hour, 10 minutes even, a break, it would just be good. I did see Pete Lawrence posted up a picture. He grabbed a piece tonight. He actually got a quick shot of them before the clouds came over. So a good one, Pete. So he managed to get hold of that. But uh, fingers crossed with the 21st, that, that's the key. But of course, we've got the Geminids on the 14th, the meteors. So hopefully Alan will be able to tell you more about them. But they're perfect this year. They're on the night of new moon. So there's no moon. Oh, oh, oh! I'll have to check check me um, cloud app. What's your preferred um, clear sky? Well, I use the clear skies app. Very accurate. Actually, I do use that one myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I use the uh, weather app as well. But uh, they they all have their moments when they fail on you. <laughs> and then they have the moments when they're brilliant, you know. So, uh, yeah, but I use clear skies as well. Yeah. Actually, that's a, uh, I can't know everything, Paul. And one of my mysteries is how does the weather know that it's going to be clear for half an hour a week ahead of time? And the weather modelling is bewitches me. So maybe at some point we'll get someone from the Met Office on or a weather expert to, to explain how does that work and how big are the computers? I think that would be good because, you know, it is a very, we're an island and that means we get very varied weather. Uh, and because of all the undulations, this is how I understood it. That's why it can be so regional as well i mean i literally uh, we used to set up star parties with our astronomy a local astronomy club and literally i lived so 18 miles from them and by the time i got to them it will have clouded they usually blame me i turned up <laughs> they blame me they said it's clear until you turned up but uh, but i've had times when they've been clouded out and i've been clear so, oh, my oh my gosh oh my god i know i know paul it's always wonderful to see you you've cheered me right up out of my vindaloo slumber <laughs> Ah, thank you. Yeah, how did you. Say again, sorry. You haven't had lift off yet. <laughs> no, not yet. Not like a spaceship one or whatever it was that went off the other night. <laughs> yeah, but that fulfilled. 
nearly all its main objectives. The only thing it didn't do was land. So, uh, I mean, all their rocket boosters they've tested on those uh, sort of landing, uh, the drone ships. I mean, they had quite a few failures, but once they got it right, I mean, it's been brilliant. So, all power to them. Just stop putting satellites that clutter up the sky. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to be controversial. And that as well. Oh, Paul, I give my love to Lorraine as well. So, thank you very much. And I know she's Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Paul Money, everybody, always cheers me up. I think I first saw him at Solar Sphere, possibly Solar Sphere, do a very, very animated talk about Voyager. Still to this day, probably one of the best talks I have ever seen. Okay, so this thing, wow, it matches my backdrop quite nice, doesn't it? This is available in the Pop Astro shop. And to be honest, I hadn't really had time to look at it properly. I just thought that that was the center of the Milky Way, you know, just glimpsing at it. But it's very clever because it's got apparently quite a modern map of the latest interpretation of the Milky Way. And one of the most, my, my astronomy teacher, who basically just knows everything in the universe nearly, is was curious to notice that we now appear to be a barred spiral. How long have we known that we are a barred spiral, Phil? I haven't had time to research it, but I'd just be interested if anybody could input on that because it's just so interesting. Uh, did you know that one of the arms is called the Norma arm? How good is that? We've got the Sagittarius arm, the Perseus arm, and the outer arm, but my favourite is the Norma arm. I bet that is a, a new name that many of us haven't heard before. Hi, Vic and Paul from the oldest astronomer in the universe. Bob is 81 years young. Come on, Bob. Thank you so much. That's good. What have you seen in the sky lately, Bob? What was your last great observation? Uh, great to see and hear your enthusiasm, Paul. I've just bought a copy of Night Scenes. Now, I'm not going to attempt to squeeze into this but i just thought it might be worth noticing because i've had hold of this for a couple of years now and just on the off chance it fits anybody before i send it to the blimmin charity shop this fantastic skirt look at that maybe i could just cut it up and use it as a backdrop now this beautiful pencil skirt it looks absolutely ravishing but there's one massive caveat that's a very small caveat it's only for like someone who's like size six I, you would have to be really dinky to fit into this. But I don't want to send it to the charity shop. Maybe I could wear it as a... Could I wear it as something? No, it, it's, it doesn't, it's too tight for a scarf. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Excuse me, I've just had a message come through and I've got to monitor my phone for the guests coming through. So where's it gone? There it is. It might be a message off somebody saying they can't make it. Okay. Thankfully, it wasn't our next guest, Alan, who is due on any minute. You can also get lots of other awesome things in the Pop Astro. Oh, Paul, are you still there? I forgot to do something. You're there. He's still there. I've <laughs> my wrist. I forgot to play Rockery or Crockery with you. Oh, no. I haven't revised it. Right, go on then. I'm, I'll, I'll just wing it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way you could ever revise with this ridiculous quiz. So, rockery or crockery, is it an asteroid or is it a set of IKEA cookware? What do you think it's going to be? Okay, so, uh, first one, Iris. That's an asteroid. Iris is a large main belt asteroid and perhaps remnant planetesimal orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. Okay, next, one out of one, Paul. You're in the lead so far. Rundlig. Crockery. Well done. It's a large IKEA serving plate. I haven't been <laughs> here at all. <laughs> <laughs> these are too easy. Uh, these are too easy. Hygieia. That's, a, that's an asteroid, yeah. Or Hygieia, Hygieia. Yes, she is a major asteroid located in the main asteroid belt with a diameter of 434 kilometres, which is 270 miles, and a mass estimated to be a total 3% of the belt. It's the fourth largest asteroid in the solar system by both volume and mass. And now we can all sleep well for knowing that. Mm. And it works. Very good. Path. <laughs> Say again, sorry, Paul. Pray from his path. But really... <laughs> Again, I'd have put my light back on. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you were great. Thank you so much. At least you weren't like in the middle of getting changed into pajamas. They are, they are. There's, there's my light. It's my phone. It's the only thing I found. 
Very good. good. Paul, I've been pondering something, actually, and you might be able to help me with it. I suffer from dreadfully cold feet, right? All right. Yeah, OK. And as you can see, I'm very, very, uh, you wouldn't believe how many warm clothes I've got around me. And it... I'm always annoyed that the radiators, yeah, the, ga the, the 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 central heating radiators start six inches above where my feet are, yeah? So okay. the gap where I really want to be warm is always cold, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right. I often wonder what would happen to the universe if suddenly things switched around and the heat sank and cold air rose. We'd now, a, <laughs> what would happen to the universe just to get Vicky warm feet? What do you reckon? Oh, dear. Oh, well, I mean, you never know. There might be a parallel universe where that actually happens. Would stars work, do you think? Oh. <laughs> they wouldn't, would they? It'd be the exact opposite way, and they'll all be cold, dead husks, I think. But, <laughs> but then, you know, you never know what would evolve there, because, uh, you know, we're so used to everything evolving like we do. We expect everything to follow our rules. Who's to say, you know, the universe, in a, different, a parallel universe, there might be life on cold worlds, that uh, you know that, that that don't need sunlight. So there we go. Well, hey, thanks for putting the universe to rights there, Paul. Great. Okay, I'll let you carry on with um, tidying up your Christmas gear. Yeah. All right then. Yeah. Bye, no. Paul. Bye. Ah, oh, lovely just to get Paul back on there. Uh, there we go. Great. If anybody would like to suggest what would happen in a universe where hot air fell to the floor and cold air rose, now let me tell you the reason why that is. Had to go back to GCSE physics earlier. Hot air rises because when you heat it, it expands. When the air expands, it becomes less dense than the air around it. The less dense air, hot air then floats in the more dense air, cold air, much like wood floats on water because wood is less dense than water. The floating effect in a less dense medium is called a buoyant force or a displacement force. But what effect would this have on the universe if it was to be switched around. Freaky, drop some answers into the chat and let me know why I can't have warm feet in this version of the universe. Right, we're going over to our second guest now. It's Alan in three, two, one. Hi, Alan. Hi, hi, hey. Vicky. Glad so, it's... You're looking, is that a nice festive jumper? I should have put it, mine on it, It's kind of nice. Do you want to see the whole jumper? Yeah, get up, get up, get up. Okay, I'll warn you, it's scientifically accurate. Okay. okay. Go on. There we go. So oh. if, a, if a dinosaur and a reindeer ever met, scientifically, that's what would happen. Uh, scientifically. Uh, isn't there an a absolutely quite painstaking simulation somewhere on the internet of 10,000 chickens versus like 10 Tyrannosaurus rex? Have you seen it? No, but I'm guessing what the outcome would be. Still. I can't remember who won, actually. It's yeah, lots yeah. of little it, ransom CGI chickens. Except given that birds evolved from dinosaurs, isn't that kind of cannibalism? <laughs> Probably is, yeah. But, yeah. you know, but, well, I, I can see you like your dinosaurs. I'm Daleks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure which who wins in that competition. <laughs> that would be some kind of really interesting new kind of mixed martial arts cage fighting with Daleks and dinosaurs. Yeah, it's probably been covered in Doctor Who at some point. I'm sure somebody <laughs> will, will comment or write in and let you know. Oh, brilliant. So whereabouts are you from this evening then? Well, I, I am based at Queen's University Belfast and I live just on the outskirts of Belfast. And indeed, this has been my office since the beginning of the first lockdown. And uh, and I've managed to feel relatively comfortable uh, uh, up until now, but it but it'll be nice to get back into a proper research environment uh, uh, in in 2021. I think we're all feeling that. Yeah, who knew that working from home would eventually grind us all down more than the nine to five grind? <laughs> yeah, don't don't you actually look forward to commuting now? I mean, seriously, it's a uh, it's a strange state of affairs we find ourselves in these Give days. Give me those M62 traffic jams any day of the week <laughs> rather than sitting on Zoom in my pyjamas. Well, no, <laughs> I, I don't think I meant that. No, I'm sure not. <laughs> I don't think I meant that. Maybe just, rem just remember to keep your camera switched off. You'll be fine. <laughs> so brilliant. So uh, first of all, I hear that a very minor congratulations might be in order uh, after you've discovered something. Was it last week or this week? Oh, the new comet. Yeah, found another comet. Another. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, just to explain, if people don't know, uh, uh, I'm part of uh, one of the near Earth object surveys uh, that are scanning the sky every night. Uh, it's called the Atlas Survey. The Asteroid Terrestrial Last Alert System, 
and effectively it's an early warning system if we've got a small asteroid uh that um uh, is on an impact trajectory to us that that may hit us in the next few days it's got a good chance of, of finding it as long as it's coming from out there beyond Earth's orbit rather than coming in from the sun like the Chelyabinsk impact it did back in 2013. Uh, but of course, we, we pick up a whole bunch of stuff uh, as well in that, uh, in that survey. And every once in a while, uh, we pick up a new comet. And uh, Atlas, uh, the, the people on the Atlas project, we've, we've found about 50, over 50 comets now. And uh, we found the latest one. Well, actually, we found, hmm, shall I say this? We found certainly one we've announced um, uh, and was uh, uh, um, uh, made, made official uh, 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 last week. Um, we've got another one in the bag that people may hear about soon. It's actually, to be honest, it's, a, it's, it's just, a, it looks like another standard comet, although it looks like it's, it's quite weakly active. Uh, but yeah, we find these things all the, uh, uh, quite often. And it, it, it's pretty nice because it's you actually, you know, every week we, we find new near-Earth asteroids, and that's always exciting. Uh, but actually, occasionally, we see a little fuzzball just at the limits of our detection system, and that's pretty pretty nice as well. It's always nice to find another little fuzzball orbiting the sun. Right, okay. So um, the SPA is a Society for Popular Astronomy, welcomes astronomers and people curious about space, um, especially newbies. So let's go back to basics here about why are the little things that whiz around in space very quickly? First of all, what are they and why are they so fascinating to us? Well, these little things, the, the, these objects that are much smaller than planets, in fact, even much smaller than dwarf planets, which are smaller than planets, uh, these are important to us because of two reasons. First of all, some of them, particularly the comets, date back to the beginning of our solar system, four and a half billion years ago, 4.6 billion years ago, to be precise. And if we study those, first of all, we can hopefully figure out uh, what the stuff was around, uh, what stuff was around back then. And that then gives us clues to the whole planet building process and, and basically the material that you and me and our planet uh, came from. And of course, that was one of the goals of ESA's Rosetta mission, which for two years orbited a comet back in the middle of the last decade. And in fact, the results and the scientific data from that mission are still being analysed. There's so much of it every month. New papers are still being published on that. So it really, it really is a fantastic mission. So we've got the comets uh, that are really remnants of this primordial time when the planets were first being built. And uh, hopefully uh, people remember, uh, in fact, uh, some SPA members may have seen with their own eyes that uh, comet Neowise that was around earlier this year in, in late summer, a fantastic site. Uh, so we've got the comets yeah. and they're mostly icy. Now, on the other side, we've got small guys orbiting the sun called asteroids and asteroids are mostly rocky they're much denser than these icy comets and in fact if you pick one up like i'm picking up a piece of asteroid here a, a little piece of meteorite it actually feels like a little rock and you can see it's quite solid and so on now though these these asteroids they come from much closer in to the sun where it's warmer and ices couldn't survive. But in some senses, they're still remnants from the early days of the solar system. But since they were created 4.6 billion years ago, they've had quite a rough time. Almost all the asteroids we see orbiting the sun today are fragments of once larger asteroids that have simply been created by the asteroids banging together in huge collisions. And that's because most of the asteroids start life and still live out in what we call the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And indeed, as I said, almost all the asteroids we see today have uh, are really fragments or chips off the old block, if you like, of once much larger asteroids. And actually understanding how these objects have evolved first of all, and, and, and how uh, they've ground down, become smaller and smaller asteroids over time, and indeed how some of them end up on orbits near the Earth, like Ryugu, the, the target of the Hayabusa 2 mission. That's been a, a process of scientific discovery over the past 
three or four decades. And, and although we think we've now got a good picture of how that happens, actually understanding how our solar system has changed over the past 4.6 billion years and understanding how it's evolving today is still a really important scientific question that we're trying to answer using these asteroids. Okay, so... <laughs> Sorry, I'm just complaining the whole time about being cold and then all of a sudden just mountains of clothing coming <laughs> off. I like, it's like I'm having loads of different um, outfit changes in this. So, um, so I'd be very interested to know then about how it helps professional scientists for uh, amateur astronomers to get involved because at the SPA, we can play a part uh, in such things as meteor showers, can't we? Absolutely. So, so the interesting thing about media showers, for example, is that most of the well-known media showers uh, come from comets. And that's because when comets are near the sun, they eject gases, uh, they, the ices are released from their surfaces as gas. They, they lift off small particles of rock, what we, uh, we call comet dust. And when the Earth passes through one of these trails, uh, or of comet dust in an orbit, we see those bits of dust enter the atmosphere and burn up, or rather just really vaporize uh, as meteors. Now that's the case for with most meteor showers, for example, and actually understanding uh, the activity from year to year of, of those meteor showers. How many do you see in any given year coming from a particular comet? actually could be matched with the models we have of how comets release these small dust particles and how the dust particles are pushed and pulled about by the gravitational influence of the other planets. So those observations of meteor showers are really important for us understanding that process of, of where these small particles go in the solar system. Interestingly, one of the, the major media showers, and in fact the one we've got coming up pretty soon, the Geminids, doesn't seem to come from a comet. And it comes from something that looks pretty much like an asteroid. It's called, uh, it's actually called Phaethon. And uh, it's been, this has been known since the uh, mid-1980s, but understanding how a comet produces a media shower has been a real puzzle to astronomers over the years. But we now think we, we know, we, under, we may understand what's happening, which is that Phaethon in its orbit gets really close to the sun. And when it gets really close to the sun, the thermal uh, shock, the heat of the sun, cracks the surface rocks, ejecting small particles. And those are the small particles that we see once a year as the Geminid meteor shower. So I, th I think that's happening, and you'll be the expert here. I think that's happening in about three nights or so. Yeah, yeah two or three nights time. Uh, and, um, and every year then, it's pretty interesting because we think we're seeing particles from not a normal icy comet, but a rock comet. And again, understanding how those meteors differ from a normal uh, media shower is pretty important and links back to us understanding how these objects can change and how they could be how they can generate these trails of small particles in the solar system. <laughs> so every week I always have one moment where my eyes pop out, maybe sometimes two if I'm really lucky. But that was the eye popping moment for me. I did not know that there was a a, a, a meteor shower caused by an asteroid. What's it called again? Sorry. It's called uh, Phaethon. The asteroid number, the number in the, in the big book of asteroids we've got is number 3200. And in fact, it had a close approach to the Earth just a little while ago. So a lot of astronomers were, were studying it and trying to measure its characteristics. And indeed, there is now even a space mission planned to fly to it. Um, uh, uh, in towards the end of this decade to try to encounter it and try to understand exactly what's going on. So uh, we're, we're, it, it's just one of these fascinating uh, objects that ever since it was discovered have had astronomers scratching their heads trying to work out how do you get a meteor shower from an asteroid. And hopefully uh, we've got, a, we've, we think we've got a good idea now, but uh, more observations are needed. We need to keep monitoring this media shower. And hopefully we're going to have this space mission called Destiny Plus towards the end of the decade. Destiny Plus, that's like Destiny's Child with a whole set of new members in it. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 a, a real rock asteroid rather than rock chicks or, or, or something <laughs> like that. But, you know, it, it's getting there. Very good. Very good. So um, now I'm sure that many wonderful things have crossed your eyepiece and computer screen over the years. What would you say your greatest discovery was? Oh, wow. Um, that's an exciting one or... Okay, so let me think. Um, I mean, I, I've I've observed stuff that uh, we knew was going to happen. So I mean, I'll go back to the uh, to the collision of Comet Shoemaker Levy Nine on, on Jupiter back in 1994. That was that was that that was a brilliant thing. Uh, studying that and trying to understand what happened in Jupiter's atmosphere, we we did quite a bit of work on that. But I, I, okay, I'll pick two kind of fun things. Um, the first was actually going back to comets rather than asteroids, and uh, for, to, to keep things balanced. Um, we, uh, I was part of an international team uh, that studied Comet Hale Bop, the last really truly great comet we could see uh, from the UK and Ireland back in 1997. You know that was great. You, used to, you could walk out of your door uh, at, after sunset, look up, and go, "Oh, look, there's a comet there." You know, I mean, it really was that that bright and spectacular. And in that pro, uh, in that team, uh, I was part of the group that discovered this third type of tail of a comet. We knew that comets had tails of dust, and those are the tails, for example, that people would have seen that uh, the, the dust tail was the tail that people would have seen with Comet Neowise earlier this year. Uh, we also have tails of ionized gas we call uh, iron tails or plasma tails. And we see uh, those uh, most of the time in, in, in deep or long exposure images of comets, although occasionally, such as Comet Hayakataki back in 1996, it's, it's bright enough to easily see by eye. With Ho what we found a third type of tail that hadn't really been suspected before. And it was a tail formed of neutral or uh, uncharged gas atoms rather than uh, electrically charged atoms. And, and we actually got these beautiful images of, of the tail streaming degrees across the sky that you couldn't see by eye, but we could see with the sensitive camera. So finding, being part of the team that found the third type of, of, of tail uh, uh, that exists in comets was pretty exciting. If we go forward then, about 11 years to 2008, I always remember the exciting night when the first ever small asteroid was discovered, predicted to hit the Earth, and we had less than uh, we had less than a day's warning before it was going to hit us. And luckily, I was uh, I was leading a team uh, doing asteroid observations on the island of La Palma, where uh, many of the telescopes are that we use, and we actually got data on that asteroid four hours before it entered the atmosphere and exploded at, uh, 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 at high altitude. And that was an incredibly exciting time, particularly when uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Peter Yeniskins from the SETI Institute over in the US, jumped on a plane, went to Sudan, over which the asteroid had exploded, and found bits of the asteroid, i.e. meteorites, lying on, on the desert, uh, desert sands. And then we compared what uh, we saw in the laboratory from those meteorites with the data we'd got from the telescopes four hours before impact, and they matched perfectly. And that was just wow. a fantastic thing, because what it showed was that we were doing something right. It showed that if we get warning of an asteroid coming towards us, we can rely on our observations and our data to tell us or at least indicate to us what's going to happen, what kind of asteroid it is and what's going to happen when it enters the Earth's atmosphere. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> OK, now I'm going to say to you my absolute favourite ever word in astronomy. Go on then. Oh, mua, mua. <laughs> oh, well, there's a mua, mua as well. Oh, well. And by the way, congratulations on the pronunciation. Did I get it right? You did indeed. You Do did. I win a mysterious pink object hurtling through space? Well, it's kind of really more, it was kind of pinkish, but very dark. So just to, just to say to people that um, don't know about this, uh, that Oumuamua was the first object we discovered passing through the solar system from interstellar space, an object that came 
from another star system. And this was just, just really a little over three years ago, towards the end of 2017. And uh, it, we'd expected to find one of these things for decades, but we'd never found one. Um, and, and in fact, a few months beforehand, we published a study saying, well, we haven't seen one yet. So that tells us, uh, that gives us an upper limit as to how many mu there must be out there floating between the stars. And then a few months later, Oumuamua comes bowling into the solar system, zooms past the Earth, and by the time it's detected by the Pan-STARRS telescopes, one of the near-Earth object survey telescopes in Hawaii, it's already on its way out again from the sun. And we literally had about a week or so to study this thing in any detail. And luckily, we jumped on it within 24, 48 hours. And again, what we managed to do was, was, was take the light, the, the feeble amount of sunlight being reflected from Oumuamua's surface and, and basically work out or at least constrain what its surface was like. And strangely enough, it looked very much like the surface of a, of a defunct or inert comet. Now, that was strange because we didn't see any gas being jetted out. There was no tail. There was no, there was no clear sign of gas surrounding it. But we actually managed to show that uh, during its travel, perhaps for billions of years between the stars, uh, it's, the, surfaces would, the surface would have formed this kind of insulating crust. Uh, which could have prevented the sun's heat getting through to releasing the, the trapped, trapped ice and gas inside. But we don't know for sure. And it could be for Oumuamua. We'll never know because it's gone. It's already, it's out there. You know, it's never coming back. And uh, if we want to know more about these objects, we're going to have to wait to see the next one. Now, we have found another one two years ago uh, that looked like a comet called Comet Borisov. And that was strange because although it looked like a comet, it turns out its chemical makeup, the types of gases it released, were very different to the kinds of comets we see in our solar system. So we've had two objects we've now found coming through the solar system uh, from other stars, other planetary systems that have been traveling for millions, as I said, perhaps billions of years uh, uh, within our Milky Way galaxy. And the, those two objects have been completely different from one another. So we can't wait to find the third one. And uh, that's, that's going to be pretty exciting. In fact, I was on a project call uh, today uh, in, as part of a, a team of astronomers planning what we're going to do when, the, when we spot the next one coming through. And what do you think you're going to do other than jump around and shout and cheer a lot? <laughs> we'll do that. And then about a second later, we will grab every single telescope we've got, we can get, <laughs> like we did with the first two, and just collect that light being reflected to us from that object to try and work out what its nature, what's it made of, or how is it spinning? How big is it? All these kinds of basic questions you want to know about these visitors from other solar systems. That is so cool. I love Oumuamua. Now, all that just pales into insignificance against the game Rockery or Crockery. <gasps> rockery or Crockery. Uh oh. Right. Okay. Uh, we're going to ask you, I'm going to ask you 50 questions. 50? <laughs> Hold on. How, many time have, how much time do we have? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's only three. <laughs> okay. That's the relief. <laughs> <laughs> that would have got really boring. It would have been like reading out the IKEA catalog. No, basically, what I'm going to do, you're going to get three. Is it a rockery or is it a crockery? Is it an asteroid or is it something from the IKEA kitchenware range? <laughs> okay, let's Are go. Ready? Are you yep. ready? Yep. These have got great names. Grinsop. Grinsop. You see, that, that's a really clever one, because if there's a kind of little double dot above an O, it could be from the IKEA range, or it could be the name of some uh, of another astronomer, because, of course, astro asteroids are named after astronomers. Okay. Um, I'm going to go for crockery. Well done. It's a butter dish. Hey! Yeah. One out of three. <laughs> okay, right. How do I pronounce this one? Um, Barclaj de Tolly. Barclaj de Tolly. Oh, that has to be crockery. Please tell me that's crockery, because if it isn't, I'm never going to study that asteroid because I wouldn't be able to pronounce it either. Uh, you are crong. 
it's 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 a provisional designation 1981 rv4 is an elongated vestian asteroid and an exceptionally slow rotator Hold from on. The the asteroid number? 1981 rv4 1981 rv4 yes barcadja de tolly oh he's got his database out open yeah absolutely <laughs> oh okay yeah um yeah Okay, so that that that's that was tricky. So this is named after a Russian field marshal, uh, and it was named by a Russian Ukrainian astronomer that discovered it. And in fact, even, even the, the name it's given is is in Russian, not in English. So you know, I think I'm allowed to let there. Can we just say I've got half against me, not one? I don't know. I'm sorry, there is no way is that a butter dish from IKEA. So zero <laughs> points. <laughs> and the last one. Lovely name now, Smackbit. <laughs> Smackbit. <laughs> Smackbit. Would you eat your dinner off it or would you um, get Will uh, Smith to make a film about it hitting the earth? Oh, well, actually, if it hit Will Smith, I mean, I'd do that. But anyway, um, uh, so a Smackbit. Can you spell that, please? S M A K B I T. Smackbit. Okay, I'm going to say again. Properly, you're completely right. Well done. <laughs> well, I'll just point out that we do have over well, we have about 900,000 asteroids now catalogued orbiting the sun, <laughs> and, and not all of them have names by any means, only about uh, 450 or 500,000 of them have actually have numbered their orbits are good enough to actually put it in our big book of asteroids. So you'll forgive me if I don't know the name of every single one. I, I'm sure you'll give me that. Uh, well done. You got two out of three. Well done. Well, uh, as the great scientist Mr. Meatloaf sang, or Dr. Loaf as we like to call him, two out of three ain't bad. Oh, thank you so much for coming on with us, Alan. And maybe you'll get some clear skies and let us know if you spot anything fantastic and whether we all need to buy little uh, Wiley Coyote style umbrellas to hold up. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Alan. Bye. Great chatting to you. Bye bye. That was great, wasn't it? That was Alan. Thank you so much for coming on and telling us about finding some really crazy little objects speeding very quickly through space. Right. OK, so we have still got time to post out SPA goodies from the shop. Some of my absolute favorite things are these lovely things. They will just make a lovely present and they've got lovely descriptions on the back. That looks like I've highlighted it, but I haven't. That is Oh, it's a picture of the object on the back. That is the Helix Nebula, I do believe, and they shimmy around. I've got disco lights in here, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and uh, what else have we got? Oh, and finally, the Crab Nebula. We've got so much stuff in the um, SPA shop. Do go and browse, do support us, purchase the presents. Kath will get them posted out to you, make a great gift for you or for another wonderful astronomer friend that you might have. In fact, let your astronomer friends know that you're thinking of them and post out presents across the miles, a lovely little gift that they can put on their wall and think of you whenever they see it. So we're going on to our third final awesome guest now. Let me just jiggle with my settings. Okay, in three, two, one, we're going to be going to Elizabeth Tasker. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Oh. Hi. <laughs> You're very far away, aren't you? Yes. Hello from near Tokyo, Japan, where it's very early. <laughs> but I have a huge mug of tea, so I think we'll be okay. <laughs> is it 6 a.m. there now? Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> Let's not dwell on that too much. Let's not. Thank you so much for giving up your Friday morning. Hopefully, you won't have Saturday Actually, morning. We it. Yes, we have turned over. This is now Saturday morning. <laughs> uh, apologies if you are grouchy this weekend because of me. <laughs> so, Elizabeth, um, your research uses computer models to explore the formation of um, planets and galaxies. Tell us more about that. Yes, yeah, so I, um, I'm sorry, we're having a cameo by my cat here as well. We can see oh. her in the background. So before I tell you actually about uh uh, galaxies and planets when I introduce Cassie she's the black and white cat in the background and I have recently fostered her from a uh, shelter in Tokyo Good so girl. she's a bit shy but she's slowly exploring the apartment um, but yes uh, I look at uh, numerical simulations modeling how stars and planets form inside the computer which means I actually don't own a telescope which is 
perhaps slightly embarrassing for an astrophysicist, uh, but possibly good, because here in Tokyo, you can't see the night sky terribly well anyway. Um, and I look at, uh, I'm sorry, it's very early in the morning. I definitely look at how planets form. A recent project with uh, my students has been looking at the early stage of planet formation when they can actually migrate and change their orbit towards or away from the sun. And that could be very dangerous for a planet. You can, in fact, lose them into the star. And my models have been looking at how fast that can happen and can anything save those poor planets from a untimely fiery demise. Wow, well, I don't really know how to what to say after that. <laughs> like already a mic drop moment. That is pretty cool. So, okay, well, the main reason you are here is to talk about the most important, exciting news that you have been part of. Tell us more about what you've been up to. So I work for the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency and our mission Hayabusa 2 has just this weekend returned to Earth, bringing with it a sample capsule that we seriously hope contains not just one, but two samples from asteroid Ryugu. And this landed in the Woomera Desert in Australia. Uh, in the early hours for me, again, I seem to be doing a lot of things in the early hours recently, uh, <laughs> of Sunday morning on December 6th. And it arrived back at the campus where I work in Sagabahara in Japan at around 11 a.m. on, where was it? I think it was Tuesday morning and is now in the curation facility. So we're anxiously awaiting the first results from when that capsule is opened under vacuum conditions. Well, first of all, I'm intrigued to know, like, how did it arrive here? Like under armed guard or just thrown in the post or? Yeah, just, yeah. I mean, Australia Post is very good. So we just know. Um, <laughs> Yeah. The the main issue for the capsule was that we wanted to get it to the curation facility within 100 hours of landing. And that's because it's coming from what we call a C-type asteroid or carbonaceous asteroid. And the exciting thing about these asteroids is they may be kin to the kind of asteroids that smacked into the early Earth and possibly del delivered uh, water and early organics to the Earth. In short, it could be this delivery system that made our planet habitable. But the problem with that is that it's also possible that chemical reactions could be occurring inside that sample container. And we did want to look at what it looks like, similar to when it's actually on the asteroid. So therefore, uh, to prevent chemical reactions taking place and changing the sample, it really needed to be stored safely in vacuum conditions within that 100 hours. So uh, from Wimera, where it was picked up, it was first taken to what we called a quick look facility. And there, the gases uh, that might have been released from the sample were quickly analyzed. And then the sample itself was flown to Haneda uh, in Tokyo. And then from there, it was transported in a large truck, so as far as I could see, to the Sagamahara campus. Wow. <laughs> so definitely not with uh, DPD or DHL or any of the other courier companies. Not, not this time. <laughs> So, I mean, have you ever done anything like this before or is this some of the most cutting edge stuff that you've done? This is definitely really sitting at the bleeding edge of anything I've done. In fact, as a theorist, you know, normally I'm dealing with computer simulations, so it's uh, it's not practical at all. <laughs> and here we are actually having a sample coming in from space. It doesn't really get much more practical than that. So this has been a whole new experience. And on Saturday night, um, my, my role on the Hibusa 2 project outreach, um, I help convey the information from Japanese into English. Um, I operate our Twitter feed, Hiya2E underscore JAXA. And I help translate articles on the website uh, into English so people can follow the news as well as the press releases. Uh, and on Saturday night, I was actually in the control room with our mission manager, Makoto Yoshikawa, to help translate that information as fast as possible so that it came out really simultaneously in English and Japanese and people could follow along wherever they were in the world with uh, the state of the mission and how we were doing with re-entry. And that was, that, that was mind blowing really. It was absolutely incredible to be standing in that control room, looking at the screens, seeing the data from the spacecraft and you know, really getting the information literally as people knew it. So it, is that your cat? Yes, it is. I'm really sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> she has no I'm, sense of decorum, people. <laughs> I am always up for a cat appearing on a webcam, and I think we should have a prize for any time an astronomer's cat appears. What's she doing? And what, what's her name again? Cassie? Cassie. And Vicky, you shouldn't be asking that because what you're hearing is a scratching in the litter box. So I don't oh, know what to ask exactly what she's oh, doing. <laughs> you 
going to get a bad smell in a minute. Okay. To take yeah, it's very off, likely. To take your mind off imminent pongage, um, <laughs> just explain to us, because the Hayabusa 2 mission maybe hasn't been particularly well known over here in the UK. Tell us about it in brief. Right. So as I mentioned, it is go it going it went and came back from this c type asteroid ryugu and the main scientific interest here was whether these type of asteroids could in fact be what delivered water and organics to earth so in the earth's current orbit it was too warm for ice to form in the protoplanetary disk that is building the planets and therefore it is quite likely the planet itself formed dry without oceans. And of course that's no good for life at all, but the earth is teeming with life. So one of the questions is how did our planet become habitable? How did it get water, that key ingredient for life? And a possibility for that is that it's delivered by meteorites crashing down onto the early earth that were scattered from colder areas of the solar system where ice could form. And one class of uh, object for that is the C-type asteroids. So by going to an asteroid and seeing it in its pristine space-like conditions, we will be able to examine the minerals and possible organics that are on these asteroids and compare them with that on Earth and say, do we think it's likely that this is a delivery surface that uh, brought uh, the starting conditions really for life. And that would tell us not only about how life forms on our own planet, but also what it maybe takes in general for a terrestrial planet to be able to start its own form of life. So that was the scientific endeavor behind Hayabusa 2. It launched in on the 3rd of December, 2014. It arrived at asteroid Ryugu at the end of June, 2018, and spent 18 months there leaving uh, last November, and uh, last, last November in 2019. And it was an amazing success. It's been an incredibly exciting mission. In addition to collecting two samples, the uh, mission also dropped two little rovers on the surface of the asteroid and they demonstrated how to move in a very low gravity environment where wheels or caterpillar tracks actually just wouldn't work. And instead, these rovers sort of sprung about using solar power and they had a rebound mechanism where, you know, you twist and then there's a flip back and then that rebound, the rover hops. So that was a demonstration of low gravity locomotion. It also dropped a lander developed by the German and French space agencies that was able to analyze the asteroid actually from the surface. And it dropped a destination device called the small carry-on impactor that actually carved an artificial crater into the asteroid surface. And then from there, the second sample was gathered from material that we're pretty sure sprayed out from that crater. So we've actually got an even more pristine sample, which comes from inside the asteroid itself. That so delicious. that was incredibly exciting. That is delicious, isn't it? That's so nice. That is like... What a mission. And I'm quite underrated. I know one of our um, Steve Fractals here, the man with a billion faces, has says, fascinating, hadn't read or heard about the capsule with samples returning to Earth. Well, as someone in charge of the outreach, that is very disappointing, Steve, oh. because we have been in the front page of the New York Times. So, oh. And the BBC has been following us very carefully for the last few years. Oh, well, so I'm very so sorry we haven't you. heard it. That's our fault. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, we need to read the papers more, don't we? <laughs> Maybe we can talk about it in the Pop Astro magazine soon if, if there isn't one already in the offing. Yeah, so we, we have been, I mean, it's true that Japanese missions do not normally get the airtime I feel they deserve, perhaps because we haven't traditionally been all that great on the English outreach. And indeed, Hayabusa 1 actually spawned uh, three movies and a documentary inside Japan, but very few people know about it outside Japan. But Hayabusa 2, we did try really very hard here. And we have bilingual Twitter feeds. We have a bilingual website. And we've had a lot of really good support from the media. Um, we've had some fantastic support from the BBC, actually. They've been following us devotedly through the... <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> We've been following us devotedly through the mission and writing some absolutely superb articles. So, of course, it deserved even more recognition. I will absolutely agree with that. But I would like to say thank you very much to the BBC and The Guardian and everyone who has been following us. Uh, uh, OK, we've covered every... Oh, well, there you go. Uh, we've covered every stage of the mission in popular astronomy. I should know thank this. You, Robin. Robin. <laughs> so, um, you know, occasionally things just slip over, under and around my radar. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, it's because I'm distracted playing with stuff sloths and stuff like this. Now let us talk about why Hayabusa would be bad news if you were a pigeon. Why do you think that could be? I have no idea. Why would it be bad news if you were a pigeon? Is it because it means falcon in Japanese? Apparently so, yes. Good thinking. <laughs> So, yes, that's a great name choice, isn't it? Peregrine Falcon. Allegedly, that's what it said on my... Uh... I will confirm that and say yes in Japanese. It does, in fact, mean Peregrine Falcon. <laughs> and they really like... I, I live in an area where we have quite a few, and they do an half go quick through the sky. So Elizabeth gave a great talk on the mission at Astro Fest. See, I've got fans. Thank you, guys. I did do outreach. People do it's know about us. Me. <laughs> it's just me. It's just me. I don't live in a rock, under a rock, but I live on one out on Anglesey. So I'll just make it, make, make, pretend that the news doesn't reach me. So, um, how did you end up doing this job then? So, um, originally I took a pretty traditional route through my academic career. Um, I did my degrees from Durham and my PhD is from Oxford or DPhil, as we call it in Oxford for some unknown reason. And then after that, I did a series of uh, what we call postdoctoral fellowships. So these are short term, fixed term contracts where you do research with different groups to gain experience. And I traveled quite a lot in that. I went to the States, I went to Canada and I did a short stint in Japan, but still very much in the theoretical astrophysics area, which wouldn't necessarily have taken me near a space mission. But I've always really enjoyed science communication. I love writing. So um, as a result, I started to do this more and more. And I took a faculty position at Hokkaido University in the north of Japan. And I started to write um, articles on the research being done there. And during that time, I met Professor Shogo Tachibana, who is in charge of the sample once it gets back to Earth. So he's very busy at the moment. And it was around the time Higher Butter 2 was launching and we covered together several articles on, on the mission. And around this time, I realized that research was all very good. But you know, when you write a research paper, everyone just takes it to pieces. There's no, well done, Elizabeth, good job, you've done good work. It's just like, oh my goodness, I do not agree with your methods section. Your results are clearly wrong. How dare you say that in the conclusions? Our group found something different. You know, you work really hard and then just people just, they just take you down. Whereas when you write an article on their work for a popular media site, everyone says, thank you. It's really much more gratifying, I have to say. So I started to realize that maybe a position that did a combination of research where, you know, I could have my soul destroyed in a very academic setting, um, but also a lot of outreach where I could actually tell people who honestly were interested in what I was doing about the mission and have them all say, thank you, Elizabeth, <laughs> would be better for my mental health and I would enjoy it a lot more. So I started to look for a position that wasn't perhaps such a traditional academic position where there was a role for science communication. And around that time, a professor position opened up at JAXA and I emailed them and I said, look, I know theoretical astrophysics isn't necessarily the greatest fit for a space agency, but I really like writing and you put out a lot of information in Japanese and you don't put out that much in English. Maybe I could help. And they said, hmm, We'll consider that. So they pulled me down for interview and I tried my best to give the talk of my life to sell them on this idea. And they decided to give it a whirl. So um, I officially joined in 2016 and my role here is a combination of soul destroying research and also outreach, helping support the missions. And of course our biggest one at the moment has been Hyobus 2. So I've been working very closely with the mission manager since our swing by where I was still at Hokkaido University and then very closely uh, being almost um, all the outreach with press releases and articles and Twitter feeds since 2016. Oh, well done you. Uh, well, that's fantastic that you are, you are turning the tide and helping JAXA get out there and, and spreading the word of their fantastic missions that some of us might not have heard of because we've been living under <laughs> a rock. <laughs> no, seriously, that's a pretty, you must feel very accomplished. And um, as a kind of um, a content creator and outreach person myself, I know it's a lot easier to do that than to do the official stuff, isn't it? It's certainly, I wouldn't necessarily say easier, but I will say job satisfaction I found much higher. <laughs> now then, Hayabusa 2, it's got some fuel left in the tank. Has it, it has indeed. Yes. Yeah, so uh, rather than ending mission here, we are now going on to mission part two. We're calling the extended mission. 
And although Hayabusa 2 has dropped off its sample capsule and most of the extra rovers and things it was carrying, it itself has now uh, diverted away from the Earth and it's heading back into deep space. And it is heading to another asteroid that has the very catchy moniker, 1998 KY26. And this is a completely different type of asteroid. It's not a C-type asteroid. Instead, it is a teeny tiny asteroid that's only 30 meters across. And it's rapidly rotation, rotating. One rotation spin on the asteroid takes about 10 minutes, 10 or 11 minutes. Wow. So uh, this is a different class of asteroid. And uh, we've never visited this type of asteroid before. So this will be our first close-up look. And it's going to do rendezvous with this asteroid. And we're going to get a really close look at the surface and properties. And this is particularly important, partly as a, an engineering demonstration. How do you even get close to such a teeny tiny asteroid? Uh, but also because this class of asteroid, you know, is a type that might maliciously hit the Earth. And that would be very unfortunate. So getting a really close look at uh, what these asteroids are like and what they might be made of and what their composition is like might help us for planetary protection in the future. Woohoo! You can drop the mic now. No, you can't pick it back up. You've got to play rockery or crockery. Oh no! I saw the end of this game from your last poor tragic guest, and this might go very wrongly. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, let me have a shuffle of the orders. Actually, so I'll save the funniest one till last. <laughs> okay. Are you are you ready? I am. I'm ready. ready. Okay. Number one. Is it an asteroid or is it IKEA serving gear? Uplaga. I'm going to go for Ikea. Well done. It's a serving plate. Do you have, <laughs> do you have, do you have Ikea in Japan? Yes, we do. Uh, our, most, uh, our most common store is actually Nitori, which is a kind of Japanese equivalent, but we also do have Ikea. Wow, that's pretty cool. Okay, uh, second to last one. Gladilig, dinner plate or asteroid? Gladilig. I'm going to go with an asteroid for this one. I'm sorry, you were wrong. It is a oh. dinner plate. It's a dinner plate that looks like a cabbage leaf from what I could work out. Well, that could still be an asteroid. I mean, let's not rule that out entirely. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Dikanka. <laughs> Dikanka. So D-I-K-A-N apostrophe K-A. Vicky, the spelling doesn't help me. <laughs> um, I'm going to optimistically hope that you gave me one asteroid and say it is an asteroid. It is a minor planet. Yay. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'll let you. Are you going to go back to sleep now or are you going to go up and go for I, I really more? Yes. Yes, I, I, I am going to go back to it. Now, since you've told me that you completely hadn't heard of Hayabusa 2, I'm also That's going me. to do that. That's me, not you. I, I feel that you owe me a plug for our next mission, Vicky. May I plug our next mission? I'll give you full screen and and <laughs> shut up. Um, let me let me right, hang on. I'll put you full screen. What's your next mission called? Our next mission is called MMX Martian Moon Exploration Mission, and it is another and, um, sample return mission. And, um, so it's uh, I'm going to do better than that. <laughs> MMX Martian Moon Exploration. Mission, yes, it is going to the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. And you the have got aim your own is banner now, look. Got your oh, own there we go. Now I feel truly, truly planned. And it's uh, it's going to the Mars, uh, the Martian moons. We're going to collect a sample from Phobos and bring that back to Earth. We're launching in the fiscal year of 2024, and we should be back in 2029. And the Martian moons are a bit of a mystery because we don't exactly know where they came from. They look like potatoes, which suggests they could be asteroids or Ikea pottery. Uh, but on the other hand, they could also have been formed from Mars itself like our own moon did in a massive collision that caused material to be indexed into orbit and coalesced into the two moons. And we don't know which of these scenarios is right, but they're both pretty exciting. If it turns out that they are captured asteroids, then they're telling us again about how material might have moved from the outer solar system to the inner solar system. So it's part of our cunning plan to actually trace water through the early solar system and find out how it ended up on Earth. On the other hand, if they were cut from an early Mars, then we get to look at about how Mars might have looked during its early evolution, where it might have been a lot more similar to the Earth and maybe even habitable. So that's a really exciting mission, and I hope you all keep an eye out for news from that. Consider me riveted. 
<laughs> thank you Thank so you so much. Get back to bed and I hope you drift up back to sleep and don't have those weird morning dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. Bye, everyone. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh, that was fantastic, wasn't it? Slightly embarrassed there for me and Steve Fractals, who pretended we hadn't heard about the mission, but although I must have, it's been a busy week. Really fascinating talk from Elizabeth. Clearly a great public communicator. Yes, she's brilliant, Jeff. Lovely voice. I recommend Elizabeth... Oh, she never mentioned her book. She could have spoken about that. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. We're in the dunce's corner. I'll put a triangle hat on. Great, everybody. Thank you so much. Let me just get my closing notes up on the screen. It's 20 past nine. It's a late one, everybody. Did you notice I've given you an extra half an hour? Um, thank you so much to everybody who's joined in, contributed. Um, I think we might even have somebody from Skyrora on. If you don't hear, if you haven't heard of that name, you will have next week. Skyrora is a rocket company based up in Scotland and they're really, really cool. I don't know what the guests are going to have, but as you can imagine, they will be fantastic. We will keep on bringing you the cutting edge of astronomy entertainment. Hey, that's a good strap line for the show. Okay. Oh, I forgot to tell you, popular astronomers, do you remember a couple of weeks ago when I was angling my stream screen up and we had uh, a butterfly on in, in light? Do you remember? There was a tortoiseshell butterfly that woke up because too much light, too much heat, wakes it up from hibernation stroke torpor. And I was really worried because it was trapped in the light filter. And Johnny came down. Uh, after my show to help me pack away and he stood on a chair and we did butterfly rescue live on the pop astro feed and thought you'd all be amazed at the butterfly rescue anyway it turns out that i posted it in the wrong forum and live butterfly rescue went straight into the alcohol free challenge forum that i'm doing at the moment so that was very random but you'll be pleased to know that we've rescued the butterfly and it is now in a tupperware in a cupboard so hopefully it'll be fine very interesting guest tonight. Thank you, Bob. I still await my constellation visage. Yes, I do remember. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. So I know, weren't they so good? They weren't my choice. Paul Muddy was my choice, but um, Paul Sutherland helped me fish out the other two from the depths of the astronomy cosmos. Let's have a look. It's been fab again, Vicky. I don't want to go, but I think I really have to get in a sore throat now. Oh, <gasps> no. I'm not getting a sore throat. It's just from talking. Really enjoyed it tonight. Like you, I must have read about it. It's deaf and her deaf. I heard about the blah, blah, blah. Mom, who's my mission sample? Oh, Mel, you were on last week. Thank you, Talking Occultations. That was a great show with you on. Thank you. Much appreciated, everybody. I'm going to switch the off button in about 10 seconds. So speak now or forever hold your comment. Fabulous guests. Yes, weren't they? Do you think Paul wrote that? I'm going to get my knuckles wrapped now. I know I am. I'm going to open my... So every time I finish the show, I wait for about three minutes and there'll be an email off Robin or Paul saying about the show. So I'm probably going to get my knuckles tickled now about, about not knowing or not remembering about how it was to. Don't shower me. No butterflies were harmed in the making of this production. Good night, David Gray.